to come. And um, if you have any questions, you can see anyone on the Ladies' Council. Summer, Crystal, obviously me, um, Kim, Sandy. Um, so there's several of us. Find somebody and ask them questions, and we hope everybody will sign up. We are going to leave at 5 o'clock from the church on Saturday the 24th. All right. Yeah. They asked me here and I said, all right. Hey, I, I want to express a, a special thanks because we had a lot of things going on this past week at church. Um, for those of you who came to help with the work day yesterday, thank you for that. Thank you for your, your service and your time here. I personally want to thank uh, Jamie. It's not, Jamie's there. Jamie and Sandy, um, they stayed awake all night on Friday night or most of the night. But drove us home from Six Flags. I also want to congratulate our quizzing team. Our quizzing team had a, yeah, go ahead and sit down, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I, I see some, not sure. I also want to congratulate our quizzing team. They went to a quiz at Dell City yesterday, and individually they took, what was it, fifth and eighth, I think, fifth and eighth. But overall, they were assigned to some other, oh, wait, 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 don't clap, wait, don't clap, wait, wait, it gets better. But they were, they were combined with another couple students, and they made a late O team, which I like how we got the team naming rights or something. But the late O team actually took first overall. <laughs> and I also want to thank Crystal for stepping in for Matt. Um, Mr. Matt and Miss Rachel have taken some vacation time so they can enjoy the last weeks of summer and this nice weather transition, so thank you, Crystal, for stepping in for us. Now I'm going to ask you to stand back up because we've got some visitors with us. Greet one another in Jesus' name.
Thanks be to God for such a great Savior who can change the leper spots and make us white as snow. Praise the Lord for his goodness and grace. You may be seated. We're going to be preparing for receiving our tithes and offerings uh, this morning. Um, I want to personally thank everyone that worked so hard yesterday. We had a small but very committed and dedicated uh, team that helped to make our facilities an attractive and safe place to learn and worship. So give a th thanks to all of you. Now, we have rented equipment to do some of that work, and uh, some of that work was not able to be completed yesterday. So if I would have somebody that would be willing to be a chipper operator, uh, or even learn how to use a chipper, uh, Brian, uh, uh can help you and he'll be out I'm going to ask him to be out by the uh, welcome center to kind of explain what that is and then Stuart Brown will also be out there to uh, 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 welcome anyone that would be willing to give up your nazi nap and come back and work for a while this afternoon so that we could uh, be good stewards of this equipment that we have rented and be able to get that work done. So I would deeply appreciate any that could do that and be willing to do that this afternoon. Um, this is another way to practice good stewardship of our time and our, and our energy along with giving our tithes and offerings. I'm going to ask our ushers now to come as we worship the Lord through our giving. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. We thank you today for your goodness and grace in our lives. We give you praise for the great salvation. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. A gift of a Savior who can wash and cleanse us and remake us, and forgive us, and give us a hope and a life that equips us and prepares us for a life that's going to last forever. And Lord, through the tithes and offerings of your people today, it's our desire that your mission be accomplished, that uh, the gospel would be proclaimed in all of the world. So use our giving today to advance your kingdom. May your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We give you praise. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.
bringing us here. Thank you for meeting us here. Father, I pray that you're preparing our hearts to hear what it is that you need to speak to us this morning. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your love. And so just let's stand and pray. sent a text to Rachel uh, this morning. Uh, Shane Gouldy's uh, subbing for her children's church, and I, I wrote her a text and said, uh, Shane hurt his back at work day. He can't come in. Wes is taking over, but he's complaining because he has to do it at the last minute. He's trying to get a board report together. I hope you're having a good day. <laughs> and sent it. And then I sent a follow-up text. P.S. That was all a lie. Hope you're having a good time. <laughs> she wrote back, boo, you had me freaking out at all. And I said, you're making my day. I love that. Giving people a hard time when they're on vacation. That's what I have to do. Hey, Ken, thank you for all that work that was accomplished yesterday. A lot of people are here uh, working, but, uh, you know, it doesn't happen unless Ken's got it to go and organized and you know, this campus may seem small in some respects, but it's got a lot of stuff that can go wrong on it, or needs repair and fixing, and there was a ton of work. You know, it's worth, those of you who don't know, we own this house right up here we call the Shannon House, and some trees on that property, and they're just, that ice storm, those ice storms, plural, still are, are wreaking havoc on us and stuff, and so there was a lot of work put in, given in, and so, anyway. Mark chapter 10 uh, is where we're at again. Um, if you had a magic wand and you could uh, have the power to determine the conditions of your life, uh, to make it look exactly like you would like to have it, how would it differ than the one you have now? If you had the, the magic wand. Or did you ever play the uh, wish game? You know, if you had three wishes. I remember as a kid, for some reason, uh, specifically playing that with my brothers. We would walk to church sometimes uh, Sunday evening, Amarillo, Texas. Uh, church was, you know, going on. We were ready, ready to start. And we would walk there, try to get there before mom and dad arrived in the car. But one of the things we would do walking to church is we would, my brothers and I would play the, the wish game, give you three wishes. We would begin to wish this and that, you know, and sometimes there are crazy things, the power to fly, you know, things like that, have your own car. And then, of course, the third wish was always, I wished that all my wishes would come true. So there was no holds bar on how you would shape your life and create a perfect world of what it would look like. If you had all the wishes in the world, what would it be like? I've been talking this, uh, these last few Sundays about what it means to have a, a, a childlike faith. And if you've been here, you know our jumping off passage has been in uh, Mark chapter 10. If you've got your Bibles, you can open up there, or it's on the screen. Uh, you know the story. People were bringing their children to Jesus to have him bless them. And the disciples were playing, you know, left tackle or something and, and guarding Jesus from this unnecessary distraction. And uh, Jesus rebuked them uh, for doing that. So Mark chapter 10, verse 13, people were bringing little children, little children to Jesus to have him touch them. Now, if I, my reading is correct, if I remember correctly, uh, the child really wasn't considered to be counted until he was like 12 years old um, in, in that culture. I don't know how true that is, but to have him touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. And Jesus said, I saw this. He knew he was indignant. He was indignant. And he said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. I tell you the truth, if anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms and put his hands on them and blessed them. I just love that passage, blessed them. And the question I've been asking this, uh, these last few Sundays is, is, 
Well, what does it mean to have a childlike faith? And reflecting upon that 15th verse especially, I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. If I will not, I cannot. If I will not, I cannot. And that then becomes the challenge for me as a follower of, of the Lord, to, to have a childlike relationship with God. And so the question becomes, it, it, how does that look? What does that look like? How does one do that? And so last Sunday we talked about the, the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. Is God really in control of everything? Do I really believe that for myself? For myself? And do I really believe that for the, the rest of the world? This, this isn't in your notes, uh, but uh, this was a statement. I can challenge many of you. If a single event in all the universe that can occur outside of God's sovereign control, then you cannot be tr trusted. Cannot trust Him. If a single event can happen in the universe, in all the universe that occurs outside of God's sovereign control, then I can't trust Him. You know, think about that. Is this something? Is something possible to slip by God? When I truly believe that nothing can slip out of control, then, then I can trust him. So is God sovereign? The question today is, is, is God truly wise? Can I trust his judgments? Can I trust him to know what is best for me? Now, of course, the Sunday school answer is that, that God is infinite in power and he's, he's sovereign and he, and he is infinitely wise as well. That's the Sunday school answer, of course. But have you ever entertained the thought, uh, I sure hope God knows what he's doing. Have you been there? You know, Stan Toller, many of you know, wrote a book one time. I remember, God has never failed me, but he's sure scared me to death a few times. That was the title of the book. He's never failed me, but he sure scared me. I sure hope God knows what he's doing. Have you ever been there? I, I can tell you I have. I've been there. Dark moments of life, you know. Fearful moments of life. Moments of sadness. I, I've met other people who have been at that, that point in their life. Uh, you know, I've conducted my share of funerals in my days. People crying, missing their loved ones. Wondering, wondering why, wondering why. Is it sacrilege to say, to ask, does God really know what he's doing? At 9.15 a.m., just after the children had settled into their first lessons on the morning of October 21st, 1966, a waste tip from South Wales coal mine slid into the quiet mining community of Aberfan. Of all the heart-rendering tragedies of that day, none was worse than the fate of the village junior school. The black slime slithered down the man-made hillside and oozed its way into the classroom. Unable to escape, five teachers and 109 children died. A clergyman being interviewed by the BBC reporter at the time of the tragedy in response to the inevitable question about God said, well, I suppose we have to admit that this is one of those occasions when the Almighty made a mistake. The Almighty made a mistake. You know, I, I go back to my illustrations I've been using during this time, talking about, you know, in childhood, whenever you were young, um, you felt that you could trust mom and dad for everything. They had the answer for everything. I can't remember as a child worrying about anything. You know, mom and dad had the answer. And yet, as I grew older and more mature in my ways, my parents became more human to me, uh, more fallible. And, and on occasion, I discovered that I did not necessarily see the universe the same way that they saw it. And perhaps you've been there with God. Perhaps you looked into his word. And, and you have read... I don't know, any number of his directives. And even after reading his word, you have become to a, a more mature, a more enlightened, a better informed view of things. Rather than, you know, 
well, you see, Pastor, I can explain that. Or perhaps you have encountered a difficult crossroads like I've talked about in your life. And you don't like it. And you don't know why God has allowed it. And you come to a place and, and you have wondered, God, are you really sure you know what you're doing? And maybe you've echoed the words of the Reverend from South Wales, England, and thought they were correct. Well, I suppose I have to admit that this is one of those occasions where the Almighty made a mistake. You know, 15 years ago, this very day, many of us were waking up to the sad news of the attacks, the terrorist attacks, and certainly there were family members and friends of those that perished thought the same thing. Is God really in control? Or did he just make a mistake? Childlike faith. Childlike faith. And it, it, it sounds so simple when, when you look at it. You read that passage, and it's Jesus just bringing a, a ch child in the midst of them. And just saying, you see this child, uh, this is the kind of faith, this is the character of faith, this is the character of trust, this is the character of the relationship that I want with you, that you want to enter the kingdom. And again, at the risk of, of turning something simple into something complex, I want to give you four things to remember about God's act, uh, about God, the actions of God. And I think this morning I'm going to push you a little bit. Just a little bit more. And I would dare say this is probably a sermon that you don't normally hear. But I think it's true and I think it's vital as you, as you grow and mature in your faith, you understand and appreciate. And number one, that the chief end of God is to glorify God and enjoy himself forever. Normally you read that the chief end of man is to enjoy God, enjoy, uh, glorify man, God and enjoy himself forever. But it, it is also certainly true of God. Pastor. <laughs> Sounds kind of vain, doesn't it? Well, it would be if you were the one trying to do it. But... But remember that, that God is God and, and you are not. Yeah, there was, a, there was an amen there. I'll take that. Amen. amen. Yeah. Some of you are really not strong on that. I think you need a little stronger on that. Amen, right? Amen. Right. Don't make me beg. I'll get down my knees and beg for an amen if I have to. But if you do a little research on Scripture and do the search the word glory, and you will see that God is bringing all this stuff to a point where the creation will bring glory to God. You, me, and everything else. Everything else. Some of the passages you could find, uh, Romans eleven thirty six. For in him, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the what? Glory, glory forever. Amen. All these things together to him be the glory forever. Amen. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, it all for the what? Glory. The glory of God. Do it all for the glory of God. And then you venture into Revelation, you see a lot of that there. For you are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were all created, having their being. All these things were created by you to bring glory to you. Revelation 5.13, I heard every creature in heaven on earth and under the earth and on the sea and in all that is in it, them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and what? Glory. Glory and power forever and ever. Boy, that'll be a fantastic moment to be part of that. <coughs> One more, Revelation 15, 4. Who will fear you? Who will not fear you, Lord? O Lord, and bring glory to your name, for you alone are holy all nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous, righteous acts have been revealed. All this creation, all this stuff is going to come together and, and bring glory to God. The, the best possible end of all God's actions and my own is to ultimately bring him glory. Believe it or not, all that God does or allows in all his creation would ultimately serve his glory. And you need to appreciate, you want that. You want that to happen. You don't want anything to happen.
that does not bring glory to God. This is important for us. And sometimes, though, we're in the midst of a situation, we ask why, and we don't see. How could any possible thing come out of this that would bring glory to God in any particular painful situation upon us? And again, it's not that we fully can fully understand the why of any particular situation. But when you think about the pain and the anguish and the possibilities of things that happen in life, when it comes to the adversity and pain in our lives, is not the wisdom of God and Him, thus the glory of God more intimately or imminently displayed in bringing good out of, out of calamity than in blessing? you understand what I mean? I mean, if God can take stuff, bad stuff, and bring glory out to it, it's even bigger. Wow. Think of an illustration. You've got somebody who's uh, playing chess, you know, and I've seen videos of, of, of children playing chess against adults, you know, several at one time. And you go, wow. Now, if you had an adult playing chess against, against a bunch of kids, you would go, bully. It's certainly more impressive when a, 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 a someone who seems to be at a disadvantage becomes the winner. Or look through your history books and see a, a general or somebody who's brought a, um, a victory out of a difficult situation. You know, we were at Gettysburg and it seemed like the Union Army was at a great disadvantage and because of the work and the effort of certain individuals, you know, the Union won. And the victory becomes even that greater. And when I have these, um, these situations in my life which seem dire, and somehow in the midst of all that, the glory of God is presented, then that becomes even more impressive. But, too, all the events that God does or allows into my life are for the development of Christ's character within me. All the events that God does or allows in my life are for the development of Christ's character in me. We're so familiar with Romans 8.28, are we not? Uh, for we all know that all things uh, uh, God works for those for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. I'm going to get that down. I'm going to read that again so I sound smoother. In fact, you should edit the tape, uh, Gary, so that it comes out right. So I've got to read it right now. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. We like that. But, but that, that verse needs to be looked in light of the one that follows it. Verse 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Now, we good Wesleyans, we kind of stumble over that word predestined or so, but, but really, all it really means is it's God's plan all along to accomplish your will and his, God's will in his life, your life. So, with that verse, 28 and 29 are saying that all things God will work for my good, my good, which is the development of the image of Jesus in me. Now, when we normally look at that verse, all things were my good, we, we think it's going to be a happy, smiley face on the other side. But really, more than anything else, not that God doesn't want you to be happy, more than anything else, He wants to see the development of Christ within you. I think that's where we miss the mark sometimes. And if you stop and think about it, you realize that the most godly character traits can only be developed through times of adversity. Only through development, through times of adversity. I mean, the kind of love that freely gives, to really learn the kind of love that freely gives, is to be in the midst, confronted with situation, uh, of where a person is called for to give sacrificially. Where do you learn to give love freely? Talk about the fruit of the Spirit, various parts of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. If I am to be truly joyful in this world, I'm going to have to learn what it means to be joyful despite the circumstances that surround me. If all of life is pleasing and pleasant, 
then, then there's going to be a, a mere natural happiness. As I've, I've shared before, you know that many times I've, I've well, I pray for you guys. Um, my commitment is pray for each family uh, once a week. And, and I, I do that. And I say again, I tell you again, just so you know that I've prayed for probably 95% of the people in this room uh, this week. Although we got a lot of visitors here today, so maybe that 90%, I don't know. You do the math. But I pray for you, and uh, I pray for you by name. And often I, I have prayed for your, when I pray, I'm praying for your spiritual growth very often. I'm praying for your spiritual maturity. But one time it occurred to me that, that when I was praying that, uh, that essentially that I, I could be praying that adverse situations come onto your life. Situations that I wouldn't want to pray on anybody. But so often, if you're going to achieve growth and maturity, then God's going to allow a situation where you must grow and you must mature. Because so often, that's how we grow. The development of Christ's character in me. God in his infinite wisdom knows exactly what adversity we need. We need to grow more and more to his likeness. He not only knows what we need, but he knows when we need it, and he knows what's best, when it's best to pass on our life, how best to give it in our life. All the events that God does or allows into my life for the development of Christ's character. That you got that? Amen? amen. Right? I'm glad you said amen, because then we go on point number two, number three, I mean. Mm -hmm. Now get this. Uh, God never explains to us what he is doing or why. He doesn't have to. Right? Now, do you remember when you were, uh, as a parent, you had your children, you were told them to do something, and they complained and stuff, and then they asked the question, why? And the answer was, because I said, because I said so, you know? <laughs> uh, teenagers, youth, uh, college students, we got some down here. Has, has your parents ever said that to you? Many times, many times, yeah, yeah. Well, I got a little secret for you. When you have kids, you're going to do the same thing. All right. Why? Why? You know, you just want to say, you've got to accept this because I'm here, your child, because I said so. When you think about it, you talk about the life of Job, certainly a man who experienced a lot of pain and suffering. Uh, there's no indication that God ever explained to Job the reason why all the terrible suffering he had was, was going on. In fact, I would dare say if he knew the reason why, it wouldn't have helped him anyway. You, know, you accepted a challenge by Satan, and I'm the pawn in the middle of all that? You know? Okay, sometimes outwardly we do see the beneficial results of adversity in our life. But so seldom do we see it when we're in the middle of it. Whether we're seeing the beneficial ad results in our life, there comes a point where we have to trust upon God. And we say, God, your will be done. I trust in your wisdom, despite what is going on. I think that's why you call it childlike faith. Well, Pastor, should we never ask why? Now, that's what I'm saying. In fact, three Psalms and the book of Psalms begin with a why. Why, oh God, Lord, do you stand off, far off? You stand far off. Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Why? Why? Very familiar with it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the words of Jesus Christ on this cross, you are so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning. Why? Have you rejected us forever, O oh God? Why does your anger smolder against, uh, smolder against the sheep of your pasture? Why? 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 But if you read those psalms, each one of them, each one of them ends in a note of trust. 
in other words, they don't drag on with why, why. They don't grow into accusations against God. They are really just cries of anguish. You know, there's a difference between uh, demanding an explanation, demanding justice, and, and seeking God out as a child. You wanting to hear his voice. And in truth, God no, owes me no explanation. He has the right to do what he wants to do, when he wants, and how he wants. And why, excuse me, why? Because, uh, because he is God. You know, and I think that's just one of those messages that we need to hear every now and then. There's a point where you and I need to acknowledge God is God. And that's that's important. Now, this last it is a bit of a re repeat, but uh, here it is. It's important nonetheless. Uh, God's ways simply cannot be comprehended by our finite minds. You know, I've said before, I'll say it again. If, if I could explain everything God does, then God would be as small as my brain. And you don't want that. You don't have to say amen at that, but you know you kind of acknowledge it quietly to yourselves. It's okay with me. But God's way simply cannot be comprehended. And the last week I shared this verse, for, for my thoughts and not your thoughts, neither are your ways. My ways, declares the Lord, as high as uh, the heavens, as the heavens are as high from the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts and your thoughts. Here's a, uh, Paul, Romans 11.33. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who knows the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? I like that. And here's a little longer no paragraph I normally have, but if I'm to experience peace, peace, and my soul in times of adversity, I must come to a place where I truly believe that God's ways are simply beyond me and stop asking him why or ever trying to determine it myself. I don't know if any of you are necessarily willing to accept that, but I still believe it's true. Childlike faith means to honor God by trusting Him. Simply trusting Him. Jesus brings the child in the midst. You want to enter the kingdom? You want to know what childlike faith is like? Become a child. Become a child again. If you can play the wish game, with God as your genie, how truly messed up would your life be right now? <laughs> if God was a genie and you were the master of the bottle, how terribly vain and self-absorbed would you be? Some of you might be on death row by now. <laughs> That's kind of funny. I thought I'd get a little bit of a laugh, but it's like, whoa, pastor. Trusting in Him <clears throat> truly is best. Childlike faith. Childlike faith. We sang it at the end of the sermon last Sunday. Uh, the old song, "Just So Sweet to Trust in Jesus." All right, try it again with me. Try it again with me. Okay, I didn't get that last line. I'm sorry for those of you who fill the blank one. Fill it in quickly because I'm about to click. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the same. Ah. Uh -huh. 
that song, the last words of that song, needs to be your prayer. Oh, for the grace, Lord, to trust you more. Lord, it is true that often we don't understand the reason why. And maybe on that side of heaven, that we will have a better understanding. Maybe not. Yet, Lord, right now in our minds and our hearts, we declare you as the good Father, the loving Father, the sovereign Father, and the wise Father. And here we are again in this moment, committing ourselves to you, Lord. And by the greatest faith we can muster, say, Lord, we believe. Help us in our unbelief. Bless these people. Certainly many of them are facing various trials and tribulations. Lord, and while we may not understand, your word clearly promises for us to have the strength to go through and the power to go through. Would you would you grant us that power, that trust, that faith? Lord, and we say these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our living Lord and Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I love you guys. Good to have you here. God bless you. You are dismissed.